Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is Colossians chapter 1, the epistle reading, which really talks about Jesus almost exclusively. And today my sermon theme based on that text is about Jesus. And you might ask yourself, well, he announced that today was Holy Trinity Sunday, and he's using this long creed which talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he gave the kids tricolored popsicles, which was supposed to be a example of how something can be in three and one. And yet he's going to talk about Jesus. What's that all about? Well, I submit to you that when you talk about Jesus and when you learn about Jesus and when you embrace Jesus as your friend and as your Savior and as your Lord and your King, you're talking about the Trinity. And if you do otherwise, you start eroding the biblical doctrine that God is three in one. The church has always had that problem. That's why it has three creeds. Before the apostles died, I think it was before they died, the early Christian church said, well, Peter, James, and John aren't going to be around here anymore. Let's put together in one little short creed what they're teaching about. And Peter and James and John told them once again that God is the Father who created us. Jesus is the Son who became man and redeemed us. And the Holy Spirit is the pusher God who pushes us towards the cross and towards faith. And we had the Apostles' Creed, and you think everything would have been fine. We got it straight from the words of the 12 who walked and lived with Jesus before they themselves went to heaven. But historically, there's always been an attack on the Lord Jesus. People have always wanted to demote Jesus, if you will, to bring him a little lower, to say that he wasn't truly God, or sometimes the reverse. He was all God and no man. He was kind of a guy walking on water all the time. So the church, for a long time, and to this day, has to confront this problem of not seeing Jesus correctly. And St. Paul gets it right for us in Colossians chapter 1 which I'm going to break down into two sections, two section, and then I'm going to add my own third section under the theme, the supremacy of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. So in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it starts out by saying, this is who Jesus is. He is, now I quote the Bible, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things were created through him and for him. Usually we associate creation as the work of God the Father. But according to this passage, Jesus was right there. Hmm? When the world was created, Jesus was right there, creator. That's one reason, I think, that when he said to the waves, be still, they were still, because the waves knew who the creator was. It was the Lord Jesus, the triune God. When he told the winds, I wish he'd do that around here, when he told the winds to be quiet, Jesus, the winds obeyed, and they were quiet. And the disciples in the boat of that storm were amazed, and they said, even creation obeys him. Jesus is authentic God because he was eternal, and he was part of the, part of the creative process. We people are like sentences. Human beings are finite. We have a capital letter at the beginning of our sentence, our birth, and we have a period. <coughs> It's the end of the sentence, it's called death. It's called death, and our life is finite, it's mortal. Jesus was not that way. As God, he has no beginning and no end. 
when he became a human being, he had a beginning as a human being conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, okay? And then his earthly life ended at his ascension. But he still has his body in heaven. The point is, Jesus as God has no beginning. And you remember the story by Mark Twain of the prince and the pauper? Uh, forgive me if I've used this example before, but let me share it to you real quickly. Mark Twain's story in 1859 no, 1861, I have another story that was written a little earlier. It doesn't make that much difference. About two boys that looked identical. One boy was named Tom, and he came from a poor family. His father was abusive. He was an alcoholic, and all Tom wanted was a better life. And the other boy was Prince Edward, Prince Edward VI, the son of King Henry VIII. And, of course, Edward lived in a palace. One day, Tom goes by the palace, and somehow the two boys switch roles. The king becomes a peasant and leaves the palace grounds, and Tom, who always wanted the fine life, becomes, apparently becomes the king because he looks so much like him. And the story goes on and on until finally Tom, who is set to be inaugurated, dad dies to be inaugurated, and he can't, not inaugurate, coronated, coronated. The crown would be put on Tom's head, the pauper, and they say, you need to come up with the great seal. Only the, only the royalty knows where the great seal is. Tom says, I can't find the great seal. I don't know where the great seal is. Well, then we're not going to crown you. And Edward somehow gets back to the palace right before the coronation, and he says, I can find the great seal, which authenticates that Edward is the true king. Jesus knows where the great seal is. Jesus is authentically God. Jesus is defended by the church in the three creeds that he is true God and true man. And that shows the supremacy of Christ. Our Savior is the real deal. At creation. The second part of Colossians goes on. It's kind of a short passage where St. Paul talks about something else, not about his creatorship, but about his work of redeeming the world. I'm sure we've all had the experience of hiring a professional who doesn't quite get the work done correctly. Hmm? Wouldn't it be awful if you found out that Jesus didn't get his work done quite thoroughly, that redemption and rescue from our sins and hell was in doubt? St. Paul puts that to rest, where he goes on. And he, this Jesus, is the head of the church, the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, starting with people. And then creation. Do you know creation moans too? Because of sin, creation, nature, the universe is kind of crying to be uh, justified, to be reestablished the way it should be. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. The supremacy of Christ is also seen in his redemptive work because he is God. His work is efficient and sufficient. There are a lot of people out there that try to demote Jesus and this work of redemption, that try to deprecate him, that try to, they don't try, they, they impose additional work additional things to make sure your, re your salvation is complete. Totally unnecessary. The Jews, you know, said, well, you have to be circumcised. Yeah, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have to be circumcised. The Greeks said, yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have to refrain from certain food. There are Christian churches today that say things like that. I think we Lutherans have to be careful and say, yeah, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have to act a certain way. 
You know, you have to have this layer of piety. Now, I like people who are devout and pious, but it ain't going to do nothing for you. It's immaterial if you do that because the Bible teaches, St. Paul says, in him is the fullness of God and all things are reconciled to the Father because of the work of Jesus and the shedding of his blood. Another story, 1859, that's not important, by Charles Dickens. You probably read this story as well, A Tale of Two Cities. It's a tale of two cities, Paris and London. Mm -hmm. It's in the 19th century, takes place in the 19th century, when the French Revolution was being overthrown, where the aristocrats would say, oh, the peasants don't have bread? We'll tell them to eat cake. How insensitive, a chasm between the two classes. And the peasants were full up there. There was a good guy named Charles Darnay. He left France because he couldn't stand the attitude of his countrymen. He had a look like, look like, he was Sidney Carlton, and he was a thug. He didn't make anything out of his life. He ended up in jail, had all kinds of problems. They both fell in love with the same woman, of course, of course, okay? And as things would have it, Darnay, the aristocrat who was unhappy with the attitude of his peers, went back to Paris and ended up in jail where Sidney Carlton was. And they were going to execute Darnay. You know how they did it in those days? <coughs> okay. And it was this close to Darnay being executed, a nobleman in character and in um, social class. And uh, Carlton says to himself, I have not done anything with my life. Maybe I can do something here. And he changes clothes with Darnay, the nobleman, Okay, he changes clothes, um, and um, they drag out Darnay, and he is safe. And the thug, Sidney Carlton, goes to the guillotine for him. Hence the famous phrase, it's by far the best thing I've done in my life. If you flip that a little bit, that's what God did for you and for me. He took on your rags of sin and thugness, and selfishness, and uh, all that, the, the messes we can make with our life. I read that again yesterday. Only people can make problems uh, the way they do. You don't see dogs making problems for ourselves the way you do. You don't see nature making problems. But we people, we have this, we have this theme within us that rebels against everything God wants for us. So he changes his clothes, and Darnay is free, and, um, and Carlton goes to the guillotine. That's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Jesus, the God, the supremacy of Jesus, God did that for you and for me. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Now, the text ends here. But as I was writing the sermon, I thought the supremacy of Christ on Trinity Sunday. It's kind of different. And my question came, question came to my mind, is can a church be, can a church be too, can a preacher be too Christ-centered? Hmm? Can a church be too Christocentric? And I thought, that's kind of a heretical question. So I Googled it. And I wrote that down. Can a church be too Christocentric? And it came up, and other people are asking the same question. And this is what I found out. When you honor Jesus, you honor the Father. Because the Father honors Jesus. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When you honor the Holy Spirit... You, I mean, you honor Jesus, you honor the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Remember last week when we did a little pushing? Remember that? Was that last week? On Pentecost Sunday. The Holy Spirit doesn't want attention. He pushes you to Jesus. So the answer to the question, 
Can Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church be too Christ-centered? The answer is no. You can't have enough crosses in this church because it points to Jesus. Hmm? Some churches don't even have a cross on the outside. Let's have a thousand crosses in this church. You can't have hymns, enough hymns that speak about Jesus. There's some hymns that are kind of weak. But we've got some, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in our believers' ears. It drives away our fears. Our fears. So on this Sunday of looking at, once again, especially through the creeds of the church. By the way, what are the others? Apostles, what's the next one? Nicene Creed, a little bit longer, written in 325 A.D. And the heresy kept going, 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 trying to demote Jesus. So Athanasius in the 5th century wrote his creed. That's the one we're doing this morning. Always defending the su supremacy of Christ. Supremacy of Christ. So on this Sunday of the creeds and the doctrine of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we talk about Jesus because he's in the center and who for us men and for ourselves she came down from heaven. Sing about Jesus daily. Come to church and don't think he's talking too much about Jesus because that's the way we honor the triune God. The, the sufficiency and the supremacy of our precious Lord Jesus. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in who? Yeah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in Christ Jesus. And when you're in Christ, you have the Father and to life everlasting. Amen. Now let